In an article from January of 2010, the Associated Press writes, Supreme Court ends limits on corporate campaign spending. The Supreme Court ruled today that corporations may spend as freely as they like to support or oppose candidates for president and Congress, easing decades-old limits on business efforts to influence federal campaigns. The justices also struck down part of the landmark McCain-Feingold campaign finance bill that barred union and corporate paid issue ads in the closing days of election campaigns. Washington A closely divided Supreme Court on Thursday swept away long-standing limits on campaign spending by unions and corporations. In a long-awaited decision, the court's emboldened conservative majority declared that the limits on so-called independent expenditures by corporations violate First Amendment free speech rights. Remember, corporations are now people, too. The much-anticipated decision means that more money can be spent on federal elections, including this year's congressional elections. This means that corporations now have the same rights as you or me. So what does this precedent, set by the Supreme Court, have to do with taxpayer money? To get the answer to this, let's take a look at the Sunshine Review. Here we have Delaware taxpayer-funded lobbying. Taxpayer-funded lobbying is the practice of engaging in lobbying activities as a public entity. This is done by counties, cities, school districts, public facilities, and many other entities that receive taxpayer money through public funds. This is controversial because the agenda being lobbied for are not decided by taxpayers whose money is used for the practice. This means the outcomes of lobbying are sometimes opposed to the constituents' benefit. In other words, taxpayer-funded lobbying is not in the interest of the voting, tax-paying public. But let's take a look at another state's taxpayer-funded lobbying. California has the same definition for taxpayer-funded lobbying meaning that the outcomes of such lobbying are sometimes opposed to the constituents or taxpayers' benefit. Lobbying the federal government by state and local entities totaled $84.2 million that year. This is the money that's being donated to campaigns. This is the money that's paying for votes. This is the money that is paying for politicians. When we go to California taxpayer-funded lobbying on the Sunshine Review, here we have a list of taxpayer-funded lobbying associations. Remember, an association is a corporation. The following is a list of California taxpayer-funded lobbying associations by type. Here we see lobby after lobby for employees of government-related jobs. Los Angeles Municipal Accountants and Auditors Association, county elections officials. Why election officials would have to have a lobby, I don't fully comprehend. Perhaps they're the ones that accepted bribes to get the riggable, diebold electronic voting machines in place for California elections. San Diego County Employees Retirement Association. The list goes on and on. California Association of Highway Patrolmen, California Professional Firefighters, Law Enforcement, Police Officers, California Attorneys, Administrative Law Judges, and Hearing Officers in State Employment. Why do these people need a lobby? Association of California School Administrators, Association of Low Wealth Schools, Retired Teachers, Federation of Teachers, School Boards Association, School Employees Association, it goes on and on. Association of Joint Powers Authorities, Local Agency Formation Commissions, Professional Scientists, (laughs) Sanitation Agencies, Why, why do trash men need a lobby? I mean, really, do trash men need taxpayer money to have a lobby so that they can ask the government for something? It doesn't make sense. California Fish and Game Warden Supervisors and Managers Association. 
Public Parking Association. Remember, public parking has become a privatized corporation. So your taxpayer money is going to a private company to lobby the federal government in order to... <laughs> in order to make their life as a private corporation acting in lieu of a public office a lot easier. California State Park Rangers Association, Mosquito and Vector Control Association of California? What could people who, <laughs> why, what can these people possibly be lobbying the federal government for, let alone the state government? They're mosquito people. They study bugs. Peace Officers Research Association of California. All of this receiving taxpayer money. Air Pollution Control Officers. Association for Alcohol Drug Educators. <laughs> what? <laughs> Here's one. Association for the Gifted. Association of Area Agencies on Aging. Private Special Education Schools. Private post-secondary schools, school business officials, school counselors, school psychologists, school transportation officials, suburban school districts, teachers of English, teachers of English to speakers of other languages. <laughs> we have a lobby for people who speak English to people who can't speak English. Taxpayer money, folks. Taxpayer money going to these. National Emergency Number Association? It just, it just goes on and on. Then we get into the red. We get into Mental Health Directors Association, Narcotic Officers, Peace Officers, Police Chiefs, Probation, Parole, and Correctional Association, Sexual Assault Investigators Association. What are these things? Sheriff's Association, Coroner's Association, Los Angeles County Police Chiefs, United Teachers of Los Angeles and the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. These are the taxpayer-funded lobbies <laughs> that are donating to political campaigns. And now, because of the previous article we just read, the previous Supreme Court case, they have very few restrictions because you know what? These associations as corporations are people too just like you and me. So let's go back to Delaware for a moment. This is the page for Delaware General Corporation Law. The Delaware General Corporation Law, Title 8, Chapter 1 of the Delaware Code, is the statute governing corporate law in the state of Delaware. Delaware is well known as a corporate haven. Over 50% of U.S. publicly traded corporations and 60% of the Fortune 500 companies are incorporated in that state. Now, as we mentioned earlier, a corporation that is incorporated in another state while operating in a different state is a foreign corporation. Delaware has also attracted some major credit card banks because of its relaxed rules regarding interest. Many U.S. states have usury laws limiting the amount of interest a lender can charge. Federal law allows a national bank to import these laws from the state in which its principal office is located. Delaware, amongst others, has relatively relaxed interest laws, so several national banks have decided to locate their principal office in Delaware. National banks are, however, Corporations formed under federal law, not Delaware law. But Delaware's lax corporate laws are important because the United States has an important corporate law doctrine called the Internal Affairs Doctrine. Pursuant to this rule, corporations which act in more than one state are subject only to the laws of their state of incorporation with regard to the regulation of the internal affairs of the corporation. As a result, Delaware corporations are subject almost exclusively to Delaware law, even when they do business in many or even all 50 states. While most states require a for-profit corporation to have at least one director and two officers, Delaware laws do not have this restriction. 
all offices may be held by a single person who also can be the sole shareholder. The person who does not need to be a U.S. citizen or resident may also operate anonymously. Now you know why most corporations incorporate within the state of Delaware and then are not held accountable for operating outside of another state's laws. It is also very appealing that these corporations do not have to pay income tax while operating within the state of Delaware. And now we come to the most important part of the puzzle. From this point forward, we'll examine in great detail the shell game that is played with taxpayer money, and we'll look at the difference between the taxpayer budget and the comprehensive annual financial report. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR, is the general accounting structure for government, a full disclosure of all assets and liabilities. As for the taxpayer budget, which is in the red almost every year, as our politicians promise that they've spent more than they've collected, our collective taxes as citizens of the city, county, state, and country of the United States are raised indiscriminately without regard to the financial hardships it causes. But what we must understand is that the taxpayer budget is only a small portion of the government's full financial statement, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. The taxpayer budget basically only accounts for the taxes collected from you and me, and the expenditures that the government uses that taxpayer money for within the year. Of course, as an excuse to continuously raise taxes year to year, we find that the thousands and thousands of individual governments throughout the states and the nation always spend more money than they take in. And for the most part, this taxpayer budget is an honest accounting of tax money expenditures. But what is not talked about openly in the media or in any candid public disclosure of note is the financial investments, assets, and holdings of each of the over 185,000 individual governments, municipalities, states, counties, cities, townships, city councils, school districts, enterprise operations, pension funds, and other governmental corporations have in their possession, which are listed on the full financial statement. This is called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, the CAFR. As alluded to by the former Comptroller General, Mr. David Walker, this report is mandated by federal law to be filed by all of these thousands of governmental corporate structures. But in truth, the CAFR is literally the Achilles heel of the United States government, U.S. Inc., for if the general public were to ever comprehend what is written within these comprehensive financial reports, there would be a revolution by next week. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report is the true accounting of government investment and wealth, and it is hiding in plain sight. So let's take a look at some of these financial statements from around the country. They are not hard to find, Simply typing the name of your corporation, uh, excuse me, your city, county, or state government into a search engine, followed by the words Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR, will bring up several different years of these financial statements. When considered collectively, we find that through these stock investments, Collective government has controlling interest in all Fortune 500 companies and most other major corporations in and outside of the United States. I'm about to show you just how true this really is by looking at these financial statements and reading aloud the government's own words. Mr. Walker was quite right when he said that nobody wants to read these reports due to their lengthy and hard-to-understand facts and figures presented within their often hundreds of pages. But unfortunately for Mr. Walker, I am not nobody. 